Hi everyone, welcome to today's webinar, Laboratory Decontamination. We're glad you could join us. My name is James, I'm on the marketing team here at Triumvirate Environmental, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. Uh, before we dive into the presentation and turn things over to your speaker, just want to spend a, a few seconds running through some housekeeping items. You notice as you sign on, your microphones are muted. We ask that if you'd like to communicate with the speaker, ask any questions, uh, please type them into the questions box, and that's over on the right-hand side of your screen. Um, so not the hand raise function, but instead the questions box, and we'll get to those at the end of the presentation. Also, please keep in mind, you'll receive a copy of the slide deck and the recording in an email tomorrow, and we'll be announcing an exclusive offer at the end of the webinar, along with some other helpful resources, so be sure to stick around for that. Our speaker today is Craig Sassy. Craig has been employed at Triumvirate Environmental for over eight years and has worked as an environmental consultant for over 20. He currently specializes in performing environmental consulting and engineering services to assess, manage, and mitigate environmental liability. Mr. Sassy has led hundreds of decontamination projects and is here to share his experiences with you today. With that, I'll turn things over to Craig. Hey, Craig. Hello, everybody. Uh Again, Craig Sassy. I'm happy to have an opportunity to uh, share some of my experiences with uh, all of you. Um, today, we'd like to uh, reiterate our key messages is the management and, uh, and look to eliminate contamination for your laboratory. And uh, the success of research is uh, supported by clean, compliant, and safe operations. Um, this, uh, this webinar is uh, intended to help uh, researchers, lab managers, and EHS managers with uh, ensuring the integrity of their research, which is uh, most directly overseen by the researchers conducting those activities. Uh, lab managers and also EHS managers have involvement and oversight, along with maybe facilities and other, uh, other entities in your organization. Uh, it might be one or many individuals or groups or departments that uh, help manage the research and support the operations. Uh, underlying a, a lot of the success is good communication throughout your structure and team and organization uh, to support those, those operations in your research. Uh, moving on, just as a quick poll question. Uh, we'd like to know, uh, have you experienced contamination in your research? Uh, you'll see a response and um, take a moment to uh, complete that. Um, let us know if, um, if you've had experiences with contamination and resolving or dealing with that. Thanks for teeing that up, Craig. We'll give everyone a few more seconds to respond and share the results. All right, that's almost everyone. Let's close the poll and share it. So 73% said yes, we've experienced contamination in the lab, 27% no. So it's um, at least amongst the people here, it's um, prevalent and uh, it's not uncommon. So uh, hopefully we'll, we'll be able to provide some, uh, some assistance and uh, insight. Um, what we hope what you will learn is uh, how to prevent problems and contamination and maintaining a clean laboratory and how to manage contamination when, uh, when it is uh, suspected or identified. Our agenda will incorporate uh, the following contamination sources, corrective and preventative actions, and several case studies, and then concluding with summary and questions. Um, there's various forms and mechanisms of contamination, and we'll look to try and summarize and discuss. We can't go into every, uh, every type of contamination. We're trying to keep it to uh, the most prevalent. We're not going to get into, for instance, nanomaterials or radioactive material contamination in lab spaces. In fact, we have other, other webinars and uh, information regarding those particular uh, 
uh, contaminants and materials. Uh, so with that, we're focusing generally on chemical and biological contamination. These are generally managed by your chemical hygiene plan, your organization's chemical hygiene plan uh, and biological safety manual, uh, respectively. They describe the materials used, the processes, uh, and emergency response procedures or decontamination procedures, uh, who to contact, uh, just a, a, a good overview of what your organization will be doing uh, with those materials and how to uh, keep them, uh, keep the uh, environment safe and compliant. <clears throat> so with chemical sources, generally these are uh, associated with spills or malfunctioning equipment, poor procedures and careless work, but results in significant work or exposure or environmental liability. And because of those uh, drivers, there's a lot of regulations and a lot of regulatory management and compliance that is brought to bear associated with chemical contamination. So it's very, uh, very regulated from the storage and disposal, just storage use and disposal. So there's a lot of attention given to uh, a, a release. Um, with biological sources, uh, it's generally driven by the management functions of your organization. Uh, contributors are laboratory personnel, poorly developed or poorly executed procedures, such as lab coats, hand washing, excessive talking while handling media, um, and can get into poor cell, cell culture management by uh, mislabeling or handling open containers outside of designated areas and resulting in potential cross-contamination. Uh, again, as it's not as heavily regulated uh, in the event of contamination, you're dealing with uh, sources of contamination that are in the environment on surfaces, but also contamination of your cell, uh, cell cultures. With that, you get into corrective and preventative actions and how to deal with problems when they arise. Uh, cor corrective actions are generally intended to identify root causes of problems at the source and rectify and eliminate those problems in order to prevent their occurrence, while preventative actions are a more of an exercise to identify potential contamination scenarios and develop procedures or modify your procedures to avoid experiencing those problems. Um, essentially, both uh, are usually precipitated by some event or some trigger, usually a contamination event. Uh, and obviously, the corrective actions are usually urgent as it's uh, disruptive of your research and you want to get back on track as quickly as possible. While uh, afterwards, uh, as time allows, if you have that luxury to look at preventative actions and go through the exercise and process of conducting additional, uh, additional reviews. The uh, corrective action process and to some extent the preventative action Usually it starts with that event or the cause, and through that you have an investigation that will involve an inspection, an audit, interviews, maybe sampling. Um, you I use that information to evaluate uh, and develop a corrective action and maybe preventative actions. Uh, once a plan is formalized, you can move ahead with corrective or remedial activities and uh, begin to develop your preventative actions in, uh, throughout your, your organization or plan or however it needs to be rolled out. Uh, could be as simple as uh, more frequent cleanings, uh, disposal of materials, uh, cha changes in procedures, sometimes retraining, and uh, usually incorporate some sort of follow-up after the execution of the corrective measure to confirm that it's uh, fully uh, 
fully resolve the issue and uh, will avoid and eliminate the, that, that problem in your organization. Again, you're dealing with uh, typically remediation and sometimes uh, it's a process by which you're cleaning up a spill or uh, it's small and can be handled internally while sometimes you need to bring in specialized, uh, specialized resources or skills. Uh, for instance, you may need to disinfect uh, BSC or uh, clean out a wastewater system or uh, deal with a release that's uh, far more, uh, far more uh, complicated than uh, your internal resources are able to deal with. Uh, Corrective actions, you know, may be as minor as cleaning up a spill, but may trigger preventative uh, preventative actions on and look at cause and effect and how to avoid those in the future. Uh, looking at risk and exposure assessments of personnel or processes, modifying those procedures, or maybe the equipment or the environment to address uh, situations that arise. Uh, maybe it's um, checking to see that the airflow of your uh, of your ventilation system is adequate and appropriate. Uh, maybe it's the assuring that your biosafety cabinet sash is at the appropriate height when personnel are are utilizing those resources. Uh, again, it could be review and revision of your biosafety or chemical hygiene plan, biosafety manual. Um, again, it's looking at exposure, administrative controls, engineering controls, and those, uh, those elements you have available uh, to you to avoid those situations in the future. Looking at, we'll have some case studies which will help illustrate uh, some of the common problems that arise and are managed. Uh, we'll discuss several case studies. These events usually are, are triggered by the problem and researchers aren't able to, uh, able to manage or correct the problem amongst themselves with the usual, uh, usual cleaning or uh, de decontamination uh, that's uh, conducted in-house or under their, uh, under their uh, chemical hygiene plan or biosafety manual or their usual standard operating procedures. Uh, the first study involved a laboratory using tissue cultures. Uh, without any change or noticeable change in procedures or the environment, uh, several broths and media were repeatedly contaminated. Uh, and their initial responses were uh, cleaning, disinfection, and disposal of uh, contaminated media. Uh, traced it to possibly incubators and cleaned and maintained those incubators diligently, uh, but they still had recurring contamination. Uh, further investigations found uh, that a water leak had occurred from some frozen pipes several months before uh, in the vicinity and assessment of indoor air and uh, and subsequent assessment into the walls had identified first uh, airborne mold spore concentrations that were elevated, uh, several thousand, uh, several thousand spores per cubic or for, per liter, uh, and then that led us to investigate the walls, and there was no visual evidence of contamination. Everything seems dry without any evidence of damage, but. Uh, when we looked inside the stud cavity, there was uh, pretty gross contamination and growth that was evident, and that uh, was contributing to a high loading of mold spores in that space. That process uh, took, uh, wasted several months of research, a lot of efforts of uh, a large team of researchers, and, uh, and their and their materials were lost. Uh, it was quite costly. The remediation was costly and disruptive, 
they wanted it done as quickly as possible to get their labs back in, uh, back in operation. Uh, subsequent to removing the moldy building materials and cleaning those surfaces that remain and making repairs, the work, uh, work uh, was successful and there was no reoccurrence of the, the mold contamination that was experienced previously. Uh, again, because of it was urgent, it was very costly, and their unwillingness to fix and thoroughly review that contamination led to the problem. When unusual events occur in laboratories such as a water leak uh, in the vicinity, additional consideration is uh, warranted to evaluate potential effects to your sensitive research. Uh, in laboratory environments are highly engineered and uh, very controlled. In such events such as this water leak, over several months the personnel that were present didn't notice the elevated spore counts. They had no, uh, no symptoms of any exposure or any, uh, any uh, notice any odors or anything along those lines, but it had uh, significantly contaminated their research for quite a while. So in that sense, uh, it, or in response to that, uh, we would suggest that when uh, events do occur, you have to be very consider, concerned and uh, careful about how those events may affect your systems and your research. Uh, and it may not be readily ev evident that, uh, that uh, your environment's degraded, but it just needs to be thoughtfully and thoroughly investigated. In our second case study, uh, there was an event where mycopl my mycoplasma contamination was discovered in some cell culture in, in a research area that media was immediately isolated, but contamination was subsequently found in other areas. Uh, mycoplasma are some of the smallest living, living organisms and considered uh, very, the simplest of bacteria. They don't have a cell wall and contamination of media and materials is usually not uh, visibly detectable, um, making it difficult to detect. Uh, and uh, due to their due to their small size, uh, and it makes them it makes it easy for them to spread uh, from culture to culture. A single infected cell uh, can host hundreds of micro mycoplasma cells, uh, and they coexist for and persist for years and can survive minus 80 freezing. Um, these, uh, the contamination compete for nutrients, cre creates stress in your cells, and there's really no resistance present in the media or cell lines inherent natively. So they're, uh, they proliferate and grow uh, very quickly. Uh, after a review of work procedures, uh, found researchers from the various departments were not uh, following procedures well or uh, maintaining good work practices, uh, started aggressive disposal of media uh, and materials in those areas. Uh, further testing and very diligent decontamination was able to correct the problem. Uh, procedures were revisited and reviewed with staff. Uh, looking to prevent that contamination and uh, reiterated aseptic techniques and careful management of cultures and media. Um, again, having uh, maintaining knowledge of your of your culture, cell cultures, and knowing if they're uh, if they've been screened, uh, it's important. Uh, that's an important first step in managing any potential uh, contamination. Uh, from there, it's maintaining clean as uh, clean spaces, aseptic techniques, you know, utilizing PPE, you know, clean lab coats, gloves. Sometimes you'll uh, you may want to use uh, face masks. Uh, making sure that uh, you're not pipetting or uh, may, keeping open containers improperly. Um, so some of these are tools which are 
or should be spelled out clearly in your biosafety manual that uh, will help manage those materials. And it's important to make sure all staff are, are continue to practice on a day-to-day -day basis uh, good and diligent uh, good and diligent aseptic uh, aseptic practices. Um, so we had some examples of problems we've experienced with uh, with equipment uh, at several locations. BSCs or biological safety cabinets were recently disinfected with either vaporized hydrogen peroxide or chlorine dioxide posted with NSF certifications for, for that disinfection process uh, after we uh, were asked to review the spaces, uh, identified heavy organic, uh, organic loading and even debris underneath the work trays on these recently decontaminated biological safety cabinets. And although sterile, that, that heavy organic loading quickly supports contamination and dramatically reduces the, the equipment's uh, effectiveness and uh, really degraded research quickly. Uh, making sure your, uh, your vendors who perform your decontamination activities are thorough and diligent in their work is important and sometimes uh, sometimes having a reputable uh, reputable organization uh, doing that work uh, is um, makes the most sense uh, it will avoid uh, having to reclean or uh, disruptions to your research and similarly in this example there's uh, they were discovered that incubators were source of some contamination of cell cultures. The routine, routine cleaning and recent gas disinfections hadn't corrected the problem uh, over, over a time period of several months. Uh, disinfection in accordance with the manufacturer's specification using the appropriate uh, or the manufacturer's maintenance kits which include things like filters, uh, new gaskets, new, uh, new uh, cage blowers, uh, rust inhibitor for jacketed, jacketed incubators, uh, new, new materials uh, was completed. And when that was being con conducted, uh, you can see on the left, heavy organic accumulation and mold was identified under the interior components. That material needs to be removed prior to any disinfection by gas process. It, essentially, you need to wipe that material out and eliminate that loading. Um, as part of that process, you need to or follow, the, follow the manual, and it calls for the removal of shelves, supports, baffles, gaskets, filter, uh, the blower wheel, um, either autoclaving or disinfecting all of those components, uh, and essentially you set those aside, make sure they're clean, and then uh, repeat on the interior and exterior of the incubator, uh, looking to make sure you're not scratching or scouring that uh, interior surface. Uh, it's smooth, uh, smooth by design and intended to be that way to assist with the disinfection process and uh, help eliminate or not support uh, growth on that surface. Uh, similarly, uh, you want to avoid using bleach solutions on these metals. Uh, it can pit that surface. Uh, quaternary ammonia solutions, usually followed by 70% IPA rinse, is often specified for, uh, for these BSCs. Uh, routine cleaning of the bath, will, water bath, refilling with distilled water and using, uh, using an uh, AquaGuard or other similar product uh, will also help to uh, prolong, the, uh, prolong the times between cleaning and maintain a nice clean incubator. Cold rooms and uh, refrigerators also require routine cleaning. Uh, the frequency can vary greatly. Uh, heavy use, uh, warm weather, warm humid, humid weather, uh, water, water sources or damp materials are uh, 
or materials drying or open containers in those uh, in those environments can contribute to uh, uh, potential for contamination and reduce the time or increase the uh, reduce the time between uh, scheduled uh, or necessary cleanings. Um, best management practices you know, include eliminating standing water or uncapped liquids, uh, no storage of porous materials such as cardboard or paper or even, uh, even styrofoam can also be problematic. Uh, if you do have these materials in there, you should uh, really put them inside of plastic Ziploc or sealed, sealed containers to uh, eliminate, uh, eliminate them being, uh, getting, getting damp and uh, adding to any loading in that space. Um, when you do conduct cleaning, ensure, uh, make sure you're cleaning fans and coils and inspecting closely for evidence of mold on, on and around door seals or, and the ceiling. Uh, as you're moving in and out of these cold rooms and fridges, that warm, moist air will uh, rise and uh, condense on the ceiling and light fixtures, and that that liquid can uh, lead to uh, supporting contamination. As you see in the photo on the left, the plastic light fixture is obviously uh, has evidence of mold growth and an otherwise pretty clean clean uh, cold room and uh, went through and essentially had to dismantle, power down that cold room uh, and dismantle all the light fixtures and conduct a thorough cleaning to eliminate that loading in that space. <clears throat> Again, our key message is the management and elimination of contamination from your laboratory environment. Again, a safe, clean, and compliant uh, laboratory is the objective to support your research. And with that, we'll wrap up with a quick summary. Uh, consistent work practices and routine cleaning by the appropriate means and methods will uh, help maintain your research. Chemical handling and disposal practices are critical for safe and compliant work. You need to practice, practice, practice aseptic techniques to avoid uh, contamination of your media and your uh, environment. Uh, your SOPs and corrective action, preventative actions, and internal audits, quality assurance inspections, all those should be considered living documents and routinely visited and revisited and reviewed and uh, reviewed with staff to make sure that they are uh, appropriate and, uh, and uh, sufficient to manage materials and procedures in your, in your laboratory spaces. Um, continual investment in these will, will help, to, uh, help to maintain clean lab spaces. With that, we'll take take some questions. If you uh, if you have uh, something that you've dealt with and uh, wanted to um, wanted to understand a little better, maybe maybe we can help you with that. Thanks, Craig. And yeah, at this time we've we've got plenty of time here for questions. Um, they're starting to trickle in, um, so the the floor is open. We'll we'll hang out here on this slide uh, and transition to the Q and A portion of the webinar. Uh, Craig, we spent some time walking through some detailed case studies, and the first couple were focused on biologic contamination. Can you give us a quick example um, of, a, of a chemical contamination uh, you were involved in? I know we talked about sort of corrective actions and preventative actions earlier, uh, and how that action w will differ um, for that chemical scenario. Yeah. The, um, the general principles are, are very similar. Uh, understand what you're looking for, how to assess uh, how to assess your space or your surface or or what what you're looking for, the mechanism by which you you, you had the release, and understanding that thoroughly can uh, will help guide your remediation plan, your means and methods to uh, 
uh, clean a space. Uh, an example is uh, the use of uh, some pigment, pigments uh, resulted in uh, metals contamination, uh, specifically uh, hexavalent chromium, which, uh, which migrated out of a very en a highly engineered workspace for, uh, for using those materials. Uh, it had been tracked out of the space uh, and found uh, in other laboratory spaces in nearby areas. Uh, so after a thorough assessment, we delineated the areas requiring remediation and proceeded with work, uh, a work plan and cleaned those spaces utilizing uh, a double wash, double rinse methodology and resampled and continued until we had achieved essentially non-detect for those materials throughout those spaces. Um, again, it's looking at your systems that are involved in those spaces. Did it impact your either your heating and ventilation system or your local exhaust systems? Uh, another example would be uh, mercury contamination. Uh, it, uh, mercury thermometers, if you're in an old space, were used quite prevalently and common and were delicate and broke pretty frequently. Uh, many times they were swept into nearby sinks and accumulate and reside in the P-traps of the wastewater system. Uh, during, uh, during many uh, decontamination and decommissioning projects, uh, we've encountered uh, beads of mercury in the P-traps of sinks, you know, sometimes upwards of three quarters of the sinks had evidence or had visible uh, beads of mercury and required management and uh, sometimes further pursuing the, uh, the piping, contaminated piping beyond the P-trap and uh, throughout, throughout the facility. Um, again, it's knowing, knowing the mechanisms of release and migration, uh, having the appropriate materials and equipment and meters to assess and uh, identify where it is and knowing how clean is clean and establishing your thresholds for clean and uh, removing it safely and compliantly. Great. Thanks for walking us through that example, Craig. It's nice to see how, how it compares to the other case studies you presented. Um, I've got a question from Rob. He wants to know what type of decontamination do you recommend after a fire extinguisher discharge in a room with BSCs? Um, okay. even if the extinguisher was not discharged into the BSC? Right. Uh, again, it, you'd have to know what was released from those fire extinguishers. Uh, BSCs themselves uh, aren't intended to be managing liquids or even foams. So if it did get into the, into the BSC and was pulled into the filters, that's one scenario which uh, might require maybe even the replacement of those filters to deal with any damage that may have been caused. Um, if it's, uh, if it's, it may be that uh, a close inspection and certification, uh, recertification of the BSC would be appropriate to assure that uh, it hasn't affected the operation of the equipment if, um, if you don't believe that the material had uh, been drawn in or was uh, got uh, got on or into the into the components of the equipment. Um, it uh, if it has uh, if it has evidence of contamination at a minimum, you'll need to wipe it down and uh, make sure it's free of free of those uh, free of those residuals. Uh, and I would suggest uh, making sure that uh, it's operating fully. Uh, if, if there's there, if it did experience heavy loading, you may want to go ahead and also uh, disinfect by by gas and a thorough internal inspection of those components. That's good advice. Thanks. And if anyone has any follow-up questions as we go, feel free to to throw them in there. I've got a, a handful here, um, and we'll try to get to everything in the next ten minutes or so. Craig Kelly writes, "Our lab workers work. Our lab works with used needles." 
We currently wipe down surfaces they contact with ethanol wipes. Do you believe this is sufficient? Um, I guess the you'd have to look at what those needles were used for and how uh, how they may be uh, or what they may be contaminated with, and assure that uh, what you're what you're using is appropriate and sufficient to deal with the potential. Uh, loading. At a minimum, you want to make sure all the bulk material has been removed. If, for instance, there's uh, material that uh, leaves the needle or syringe and uh, pools up, you want that to be removed and prior to using any disinfectant. Um, uh, alcohol is not the uh, not the uh, not a, the strongest disinfectant. There are materials that are somewhat resistant to um, to uh, IPA uh, and it may not be uh, completely appropriate for everything that might might be suspect in those uh, in those used needles so I think it needs you need to look critically at what um, what the contaminants may be in that uh, in that stream of material and make sure you're using a disinfectant that's appropriate uh, and so so it may be you need to follow up with uh, something a bit stronger. Ultimately, bleach would be um, would be something that could be considered initially bleach, followed by that uh, uh, an IPA rinse afterwards. And uh, Steve asks, what is the best method for cleaning up mycoplasma? Uh, for cleaning it of it, uh, disposal, <laughs> eliminating anything that's contaminated with, with it is definitive. Uh, you're looking to get it out of your space. Uh, the remaining surfaces, uh, if you're, what you're looking to do is, uh, again, if, if the materials are compatible, bleach followed by IPA will uh, eliminate contamination. Uh, if you have some compatibility issues, usually quaternary ammonia uh, will be uh, will be sufficient to uh, deal with it. If you have porous materials, which are not the best to be using in uh, in those laboratory environments, it's best to eliminate those materials as it's difficult to uh, disinfect anything that's porous. Um, again, what you want to do is. If you're not trying to conduct any cleanup of your culture or uh, antibiotics or anything along those lines, you want to dispose of it and get it out of that space, uh, killing it uh, and disposing of it properly. And Rob asks a question, do you have any checklists for some of the equipment's contamination inspections? Uh, I was going to say at the end, uh, we're going to be offering a, a more of a general lab decontamination checklist as part of our follow-up. but. Craig, I don't know if you can recommend anything when it comes to equipment contamination specifically. Right. Generally, the checklist, or at least uh, how to how to how to service or inspect your equipment, that's usually in the manufacturer's manual, which nowadays are readily available uh, online through a quick search and uh, looking through the manual and finding. You know what's what's a routine cleaning? What type of frequency might you expect? Uh, and uh, sometimes for say cold rooms, uh, there's no you know, manual, uh, so it's uh, best res uh, resorting to best management practices and essentially establishing for yourself, uh, your organization, what what is uh, what frequency of cleaning would be appropriate for your operations and how to move ahead. But with that, uh, we do have a, a very short, you know, essentially uh, a, a generalized version of uh, a list for uh, equipment. Obviously, it's not specific to any one manufacturer or model, uh, but it's a general, so a general SLP for dealing with contamination on equipment. All right, we'll take our last few questions here. I think we've got about three or four more. And then we'll wrap up and, and let you know we can, what you can expect in the coming days. Um, Fred has a question uh, for decontamination of BSC. Uh, before vaporized H2O2 disinfection, would you remove some BSC parts? Would you also recommend to vaporize them in H2O2, or is autoclave preferable? 
depending upon the parts, for instance, if you have electronics, sensitive electronics, you want to keep those out or away from the VHP. Uh, as a lot of the steel, not the stainless steel, but steel uh, components can get uh, the VHP and even chlorine dioxide are both very pretty aggressive on those components uh, and possible either removing those or uh, screening those off and when you're tenting your tenting your BSC keeping those out of the treatment area. Uh, if you do have equipment that's removable that um, needs to be uh, needs to be cleaned uh, and it fits an autoclave is is sufficient more than sufficient uh, but again going back to uh, some of those photos it's you're not just tenting and treating and disinfecting and you know bumping your your BSC while your gas is in there to thoroughly uh, thoroughly uh, contact the filters and internal components you also need to wipe down accessible interior and even the exterior of your BSC to remove uh, the organics and any accumulated loading. Even on top, you're looking at dust accumulation because it hasn't been touched or serviced or cleaned in, you know, since it's been set up. Uh, you know, one of the first steps we do is a thorough wipe down of the exterior uh, before we even start getting into uh, tenting uh, as it represents potential contamination that even setting down equipment on top, a wrench, to uh, to remove uh, to remove uh, grates can uh, result in cross contamination. Great, and let's uh, take our last couple. I, I keep seeing the hand raise go up. I just want to um, reiterate that if you have a question, just type it in the, the questions box, and we'll be sure to get to it. Uh, if we don't get to them all, we'll follow up uh, tomorrow or in the coming days. Um, so, Craig, a question here from Alfred: How would you handle lead dust contamination? from lead bricks used for shielding on lab bench tops. All radioactive contamination has been removed? Question mark. Okay, so with lead, uh, lead dust, uh, once you get the bulk materials removed, the bricks themselves, uh, obviously being careful not to track or uh, pull any of that dust uh, out of that space, uh, you would typically, you're looking at uh, initially a bulk removal of the dust with uh, certified HEPA equipment, making sure, again, that you're not spreading and exacerbating contamination. Uh, and that's typically followed by, depending on the surfaces you're dealing with, if it's a non-porous non surface, maybe a, a, a surfactant cleaner or other uh, lead-specific cleaners such as D-lead, a solution that's applied and cleaned and rinsed and reapplied, pulled up, rinsed, and at a minimum, I would say with lead, after the removal of that bulk dust, you would have three, uh, at least three wash rinse cycles to remove that uh, that that uh, residual. Uh, the typical uh, off-the-shelf uh, lead lead solutions will essentially um, bring into solution the lead and get it out of the solid base and into solution and you have to pull up that entire solution and manage that appropriately but you also have to rinse any residual off thoroughly with clean water. Essentially the first wipe creates a, a very homogeneous film of lead uh, lead laden uh, solution that's maybe dried by this point and your next two processes again remove that material and hopefully at the conclusion you are able to collect wipe samples and uh, have uh, nice clean results but I will uh, I will state that uh, if you're dealing with lead there are some OSHA regulations around working with lead that are very specific uh, so you need to be careful that your workers are appropriately trained and using appropriate PPE and work practices to deal with um, lead contamination of that nature. All right, and uh, our last question we'll take here. 
and we'll follow up with everybody we, we didn't get to. Um, Thomas asks, how would you remove mercury contamination from the walls of a sink? Okay. Um, generally, in my experience with mercury, it, it tends not to stay on vertical surfaces, if you say walls of a sink, but uh, as you, uh, mercury will readily ball up and make a, a, a nice little uh, uh, sphere that will tend to roll and move very readily and it can be on a smooth sink surface, it can be pushed by water down the drain and once it, usually there's a P-trap or some gas trap associated with your plumbing in close proximity to that, uh, to that sink. Usually the best way is to uh, hopefully if you can have a mechanically uh, removed, mechanically remove the P-trap if your P-trap is that style uh, and uh, empty and clear that P-trap and manage that waste appropriately. Uh, clean that P-trap and uh, many times what we use is a Jerome mercury vapor meter to understand and track mercury vapor concentrations and move till we get to a mercury free, uh, no, no observation, and no readings. Um, there are mercury specific decontamination products that um, such as Merxorb or uh, Merkex uh, that can chemically uh, uh, fix the mercury, various amalgams and whatnot and get it to a point where it's, uh, it doesn't create a vapor and it's less hazardous but it still needs to be pulled and lifted and picked up and uh, removed from uh, either the sink surface or the P-trap or the component you're trying to clean. Um, again, similar with the lead, you're dealing with uh, a pretty hazardous material that uh, in, particularly in a sink if it's been sitting there a long time can result in some pretty high concentrations of mercury vapor in that sink and you have people reaching in and working in there. So um, an appropriate work practice and um, and uh, procedures are, are necessary to uh, make sure and ensure people are safe and you're handling any uh, materials generated as part of that decontamination appropriately. Uh, again, if, uh, if it's a very old sink, uh, it may be, it may be uh, best to consider removing that sink. Uh, there's quite a bit of effort that may be involved to uh, pull that mercury off of that, off of that sink particularly if it's old and pitted and cracked, uh, it gets, uh, it gets difficult. Great. Well, great questions, everyone. Thanks for getting those in. It looks like most of our audience stuck around. Um, Craig, if we can advance to the last slide, I'd like to share Craig's contact information um, with you. And just to tell you again that you will be getting the slide deck tomorrow morning, so keep an eye out for that email. We'll also be sending along a short survey. We'd appreciate your feedback on the webinar and ideas you have for future topics. Maybe we can take a, a deep dive into one of these topics uh, later on. We also put together a lab decontamination checklist to help guide your next cleanout. Um, and we'll include that as well. So plenty of resources in that email. Also, as a thank you for attending today's webinar, we're offering a, an initial consultation, which gives you the opportunity to speak to a professional um, about the possible contamination in your lab and ways to address it. So to learn more, um, shooting that through the chat box, feel free to click that link if you're interested. And, uh, and there's Craig's email address for those of you that still have questions for him after today's webinar. I'm sure he wouldn't mind responding to those. Uh, so Craig, that's all I've got. Any final thoughts? Well, I, uh, I thank everybody for your time. I hope, uh, I hope you found this informative and helpful and um, I can make myself available to uh, answer, uh, answer questions if need be. Feel free to uh, contact me. Great. Well, thank you, everybody. We appreciate you attending and hope to see you in one of our future webinars. Thanks a lot and have a great rest of the day. Bye. Thank you. Goodbye.